Hello, <clears throat> Rod Kane uh, with the Washington Grand Company. Uh, I'm here again to talk to you about uh, uh, ancient medieval wargaming using Triumph. As I've mentioned before, my favorite set of rules. Um, I had a request to do uh, a video about how do you set up a standard 48 point uh, battlefield and uh, game and deploy troops in, in the basic game. So in the rule book, um, it's oriented around explaining how you do that because Triumph was originally designed kind of as a tournament game uh, by guys who do like to play tournaments. Uh, however, as we discovered through the development and playing the game, it's really infinitely scalable to larger battles. But the basic game in the beginning of the book, it talks about how to set up the battlefield to play kind of a one-on-one -on -one game with your friend. Um, and I want to talk about it because it has a really unique uh, terrain setup mechanism. It's sort of the game before the game begins. And uh, uh, unlike what you'll see here as the prop, uh, you don't get the chance to set the battlefield up exactly the way you might desire. So there's some randomization to it. So in this video, we're going to cover that. We're going to cover setting up the terrain. Um, we're going to cover deploying the armies and getting ready to play your first game of Triumph. Uh, so let's talk a little bit <clears throat> about the items that I have in front of me here. Well, first of all, this is the play mat, uh, the battle mat that I have for Triumph. Um, uh, this is a little over, t it's two by three feet, but it's actually 960 millimeters by 640 millimeters. That's because uh, I have 15 millimeter figures out here today. Uh, these are on 40 millimeter wide bases, so 1 MU is 20 millimeters, so I'm using a metric uh, sized army. And that comes from the fact that I had a lot of armies that were based in the old days on uh, WRG bases, a lot of us do. Um, and so one of the things we did in Triumph is we didn't make the base size mandatory, it's, it's base size independent. But if you have older armies that are based in a particular system, uh, depending on how they're based, you can use them in, in Triumph. Uh, so this is a 960 by 640. Uh, millimeter mat for the uh, American audience or the English uh, audience uh, using the non-metric system. It's uh, about two by three feet. So as you can see, when we go from 15 millimeter or from 28 millimeter down to 15 millimeter, <clears throat> our gauges get considerably smaller, our mat size gets considerably smaller, and I can sit down and I can play across a normal table from an opponent. Um, without having to stand up and bend over. And as I get older, that's actually become quite, a, quite an advantage going to the 15 millimeter. But I still like the 28 millimeters for the, the sheer spectacle of it, and I use those for most of my convention games. So I've got my movement gauges. I've got my rule book, which is important. Um, I have two armies, which is important. Um, these are 15 millimeter armies. They're both 48 points. Um, I have a QRS for setting up the terrain and setting up the table. Uh, this is available on the WGC site. This is a free download uh, PDF. I also have the QRS, which I'm going to talk about probably in more detail later when we're playing. Um, uh, this is also available on the WGC site. I had some questions about this at the last convention. Um, where do I get this QRS? Uh, it was available on the PDF version, but now that we have a uh, hard copy and a PDF version, for those of you that did not buy the PDF at Wargame Vault, you can get this on the WGC site, and it has been updated to version 1.1. It's a little bit more colorful, um, so this is a really nice and handy tool, especially for new players. So the other thing I have here that we haven't seen yet is a terrain card set. Um, the terrain cards are in the back of the rule book, uh, so you can you can use the back of the rule book to do exactly what these cards are going to do. Um, you can also get these cards, which are just kind of fun to have because everybody likes a card. And I'll explain how these cards work in a minute, but they basically are the mechanism by which we randomize the terrain or the battlefield. Um, so it makes a, uh, an interesting way to create um, some randomization of the battlefield while still giving the player that wins the maneuver um, the chance to influence the battlefield. So. Let's talk a little bit about the two different armies that we have. We have uh, Ramesside Egyptians, um, and they also have a camp, which is important. The armies, most of the armies have a camp. Some do not. Uh, it depends on the army and what options you take. Um, and we have the Sea People. Um, so these are two very, very different armies. Uh, these uh, uh, armies...
armies have uh, different capabilities and therefore they like different types of terrain uh, different types of battlefields so depending on which general gets the opportunity to set the terrain they would pick and choose different choices so we also have some terrain over here i have a small uh, village i have what will be the basis for an oasis um, and i have a hill and i have some stream and uh, we'll play around and, and explain some of the differences in that uh, as we go through the setup so the first thing that's going to happen with any uh, Triumph game is you're going to sit down and you're going to try and figure out um, what is my invasion and what is my maneuver rating. So every army has an invasion and a maneuver rating. Um, and invasion is how aggressive was that army historically. So if you have a really high invasion, invasion uh, rating, typically you were invading somebody else's territory. Um, so for example, the Sea People known as raiders uh, throughout the Bronze Age, uh, have a very high invasion. Uh, their in invasion rating is four. Um, the Egyptians have an invasion of two. Um, so that will affect where the battle takes place. People with high invasion ratings tend to be fighting on somebody else's terrain type. So each army has a terrain type. Um, Egyptians can have dry or delta. Uh, Sea people typically delta because they were invading from the sea, so they were typically pulling up to shore and they were invading somebody's territory. So I mentioned that we have a, a QRS for uh, the setup, and once again, this is a free download from the Washington Grand site. So if you didn't have a copy of the PDF and uh, you don't have a copy but you have the hard rules, uh, go ahead and go download that. Uh, you can also download it before you buy the rules, take a look at it, and get a little bit better understanding of the, the setup of the game. Um, so this will walk you through what I'm going to take you through over the next few minutes. Um, but basically, you have categories of terrain, and then you have the types of pieces of terrain that you can put down based on those categories. Today we're going to be working with a dry terrain, because I mentioned I was going to weight this towards the Egyptian side, um, so that I could put down the dry terrain example. Um, to start out with the setup, the first thing that happens is you have to look at your armies, and you have to understand what your invasion your maneuver and your topography role is. Uh, topography is based on the army type. So for the Egyptians, they have a choice of dry, they have a choice of delta. I'm using dry today for them. Um, the sea people are delta. The invasion role. The invasion is the aggression factor of the army. You can think of it that way. Some armies tended to be invaders, some armies tend to be defenders, some were in between. Uh, the Egyptians have an invasion factor of two, the Sea People have an invasion factor of four. So for today's um, uh, scenario, we're going to assume that the Sea People roll a four, the Egyptians roll a three, their total is five, the Sea People have an eight, the Sea People are invading. That's how I got my dry terrain for today. But you'd normally roll this off. Could be that the Egyptians were invading the Sea People's home topography, but uh, not as likely when they have an invasion of four. Next is the maneuver role. Just because the sea people are invading the Egyptians, that doesn't mean that they uh, got to pick the battlefield where the exact fight was going to take place. So the maneuver decides where the fight takes place. If the um, two armies roll off, and we'll, we'll actually roll this one, so the Egyptians are going to roll off and they're going to get a two plus three is five. The sea people got a one plus zero. So the sea people have a total of one, the Egyptians have a total of five. Uh, the Egyptians win the maneuver, so the Egyptian general is going to decide where the battle takes place. However, because the sea people rolled a one, if you roll a one or less on your maneuver roll, you can conduct a flank march. So when we deploy the armies, I will talk about the flank march. Um, but remember that number five. So now we're going to roll both dice. Normally this would be done by each player rolling the dice, and we're going to get a number of four. That sets where we are on our topography terrain chart. So we started on the dry chart. We got a number of four. That would give us one piece of terrain. However, remember that Egyptian general, he got a five better than the sea people. He can take that four and he can take it down to two, which is the minimum, or he can take it up to nine, which is the maximum. Uh, we're going to set it at eight, which gives us exactly three pieces of terrain, because that's how many I have ready to go here. And we're going to put three pieces of terrain on the board. So the first thing that the Egyptian player does, he's won the maneuver, 
He's picked the number of terrain pieces he wants. Now he's going to pick out the available terrain pieces. For dry, he has a compulsory terrain piece of a rough. So he has to take at least one piece of rough terrain. This is going to be our rough terrain. Um, he can take a dune, a steep hill, or an oasis. We're going to take an oasis because it sounds cool. And then we're going to take a, a steep hill. So then we're going to kind of order those pieces uh, with the uh, large... Uh, Pieces being the lowest numbers and going down to the smallest piece. So it'll be one, two, three. Those are our three pieces of terrain. Now that the player who's won the maneuver has done that, I'm going to put this out of the way for a sec. Um, now that player is going to get to draw a card. Remember the terrain deck I showed earlier? So here's this really cool terrain deck. Also on the back of the rules, both PDF and printed form. But he's going to draw a card. So we're going to pick a card. And the terrain cards are really cool. It's one of the neat things about this terrain setup. It's I, it's pretty innovative. I really enjoy it. I don't think I've seen it used anywhere else exactly this way. Um, so you have six sectors to the battlefield. Those sectors are divided up based on those sticks that we talked about. So you've got 16MU, 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 16 movement units, 16 movement units. So it's a three by two battlefield. And remember, we numbered our terrain pieces. So we have um, one, two, three, four, five, six. You could have up to six pieces of terrain on a battlefield this size. We only took three. Um, if the terrain dot that represents that uh, section is touching an edge, then that's where you have to be. You have to touch that edge, but not touch the two sides of that box. If it's in a corner, it's got to touch the two sides of that corner. If I add a stream, it shows me where the stream must enter and exit the board. And if I have a coastal section or waterway, which is an impassable section of water, which somewhat narrows the battlefield, it shows me what side of the board it's got to be on. Now I can flip this card. So as the Egyptian player who won the maneuver, I'm going to decide where I want to put these three pieces of terrain within the limits of this card. Um, so I think that I want to have the hill, let's say that playing on my side, and that hill has to go somewhere over here on the edge of the battle. It's got to touch this side, but it cannot touch this side or the edge. So I can slide it, and I can rotate it. I'm going to put it just like that. So there's my, my hill. That's number one. Number two is going to be across from the hill on the other side of the battlefield, and using my sticks, it's going to be in this corner. And it must touch the back edge, and it must touch the side. So it's going to be right there. Number three is going to go basically here. And it has to touch both of these uh, borders. So there's number three. So that's, that's the train setup. The, the board is now deployed. Terrain is there. We'll put a few uh, trees in our oasis so that the oasis looks kind of cool. Um, and essentially, now we're ready to deploy our troops. So, as you can see, as the general that outmaneuvered the other general, I had a little bit of influence on the battlefield. I was able to uh, pick more terrain or less terrain, but I don't get to put it exactly where I want, and then i got to work with what I've got. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about the armies and we've laid out the terrain. Now you'll see the two armies, Egyptians and Sea People, laid out on the table. Uh, these are two 48-point armies. The terrain is set from our previous uh, episode, and now we're going to deploy the armies. Um, first thing that goes down are the camps. So the armies both have a camp. Um, the Sea People lost. Uh, the maneuver, so they are the disadvantaged uh, player, and so they have to place their camp first. Camp has to go in this deployment zone, in the center, on the back edge of the board. Um, so you can see I've laid out a deployment zone for both armies. The center zone is important because that's where the majority of the army goes. Camps go first, then the Egyptians will place their camp, and the sea people are placing theirs over here by the rough terrain because they're trying to hide from the chariots. Uh, the Egyptians are going to put theirs uh, a little bit more in the center. So the camps are placed. Now the disadvantaged player is going to place um, their troops. And they have to place 24 points 
worth of their army, so half the army has to be deployed in this center section. It can't be more than 8 MU from the board edge, and it has to be in the center. Um, many armies will have troops that are declared uh, or designated as battle line. And what that means is that those are the priority troops for putting in the battle line. So you have to place those in the battle line um, up to that 24 point uh, number total before you can start placing you know, lighter troops and skirmishers and things like that. So let's say you had an army that was very heavy on light troops and skirmishers. It might not have any troops that are designated battle line um, as mandatory, but you still have to place 24 points in the center. If you have uh, an army that has more than 24 uh, points worth of battle line, you have to select 24 battle line troops, put them in the center. The rest of the army can then be deployed outside of the center, or you can still put them in the center, but they have more flexibility than that first 24 points. So the first 24 points of the sea people, because they're disadvantaged, they have to deploy first. Their raiders are battle line, and their elite footer battle line, their battle taxi general is battle line. Their rabble and their skirmishers are not. So they have to pick 24 points out of this group to deploy initially in the center. So we'll just start with something nice and simple, which is their raiders. So we'll place the raiders in this center deployment. And once we have six of those, we've actually fulfilled our commitment to the battle line. And the Raiders are open order, heavy foot. They don't mind going into this rough terrain, so that's why I don't have a problem aligning them in front of the rough terrain. Um, so we're going to place them. So as a disadvantaged player, uh, see people place their battle line troops first. A little bit forward. And then the Egyptian player, the advantaged player, is now going to deploy their entire army. So their battle line are their archers, their uh, heavy foot, their elite foot. Their war band and their chariots are not battle line um, because they traditionally use the chariots on the flank and for flanking maneuvers. Um, it was an option anyway, so they don't have to go in the center, even though the general is also part of that chariot group. So for the Egyptians, um, we're going to interspace uh, some archers with some heavy foot to give us a little bit of a better chance at shooting, hopefully. Uh, as the enemy comes in. And the archers don't mind the uh, the rough terrain either, so we might put a few more archers on the rough terrain area because they can go into that rough terrain. They're open order foot. They don't mind it. And then we're going to reserve... Yeah, we'll slide them this way. Um, this one spot down here for... And there should be enough for all these to deploy. The elite foot. So they have a, at least 24 points in the center. Elite foot heavy with the archers interspersed. We want to try and get as many shots off with the archers as we can, so having them spread out means that we have more opportunities to disrupt the enemy line. You don't typically don't want to group the archers together. Also, the archers are not very um, effective in hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat compared to the other foot troops. Um, so, now the Egyptians will place their chariots, and you'll notice the chariots really like this wide open area. So they're going to place all of their chariots out here in a nice battle formation. And then we're going to stick the warband, who is also another open order troop and doesn't mind the rough terrain and can fight hand to hand, over here on the other flank. So now the Egyptians are deployed. Um, I put the general here because I want him a little close to the center of the army because remember that command radius comes into play. He wants to be able to command the troops that are out on the end of that line. Um, but they have a nice wide open field in front of them to maneuver the chariots. Um, so now we're going to deploy the rest of the sea raiders. So now, uh, sea people. So the Egyptians are deployed. They've deployed their entire force. And now the um, sea people can deploy the rest of their force. Now they could put these battle line troops out here on the flanks. Uh, there's not a huge advantage to that. Um, so we're probably just going to put some more of the raiders in this area. I'll put an extra raider over here lined up to go into the, the rougher terrain. I'll put him as a reserve. And then we're going to put the battle tax behind the line. That's the general. We don't want to lose him. And he actually probably would wait for an opportunity um, to come out if he wanted to fight. Another important thing is these are open order troops, so he can pass through his open order raiders. Now these elite foot, which are closed order, I'm going to put them 
over here on the flank and we will go ahead and line them up with the Raiders for now and the reason I'm putting them on the flank is they actually have a slightly better chance against the chariots reason being that uh, they're slightly clo more close to order if they're close order foot they will have a better combat factor against the chariots than the Raiders um, both the Raiders and the heavy foot will have trouble with the chariots because the chariots are fast and the chariots also have the ability to shatter foot formations if they win uh, we'll talk about that when we discuss troop types so rabble uh, one of the good things about the rabble is that they can travel in a group through rough terrain um, they're still pretty slow they only go three but in this group over here they could give this war band a little bit of trouble and I think the skirmisher we're gonna reserve him over here with the light with the heavy foot because he can actually pass through heavy foot uh, he doesn't want to be caught in the open by the chariots but he might be helpful to the heavy foot in counteracting the speed of the chariots because he's a little faster than they are uh, might be able to get in on a flank or because he has missile weapons he also has the ability to kill the chariots in outright battle where they tend to dance away from the heavier uh, slower foot troops so this is the deployment um, and uh, the Egyptian line uh, the uh, sea people line uh, you don't have to put all your units together so I could have put for example these guys along with closer to eight I could have put them over here um, the reason I chose to put them like this is because remember we talked in movement about groups so these are now in a group so one pip would move this whole line forward one pip would move this line forward except you need an extra pip for the Raiders because they are touching this rough terrain but this three can move together so keeping the line in a, in a battle formation like this helps with command control um, especially when you're in the early part of the game you're trying to advance your line closer to the enemy uh, so this is the deployment we talked earlier about how the sea people could have a flank march so what is a flank march a flank march is where the sea people could have reserved let's say these four units here um, you can reserve up to 16 points worth of units for a flank march and on their turn and they would have gone second they would have been able to move these in and deploy them on the flank okay and there's rules cover how they can be deployed they have to come in on a group you have to bring them in on your very first turn um, if you don't then they're out of the game um, so they won't they won't take part in the battle they could have come in on this flank or they could have come in on this flank over here and pretty much anywhere that you want on the flank um, the problem with the flank march is while it's a really cool aha got you I'm coming in on your flank it's also putting them very far away from their general so it does give you some potential command control issues and it also means that they're fairly isolated so for example if they came in on this flank very close to the chariots that's all very exciting oh look they've come in and they're they're flanking the Egyptians but if the chariots choose to gang up on them the rest of the army is not in much of a place to help so flank marchers are interesting there's a lot of fun it depends on how fast your troops are what type of army you have but for some armies they can actually be more dangerous than they are helpful so uh, it's one of those kind of advanced things that I encourage you to play with try it out see how it works for you uh, with the right army a flank march can be very effective and very deadly um, with the right army right plan and, and the right timing and some just plain old luck um, so now that the armies are set up we're ready to play our uh, our one-up game uh, this game typically takes about an hour to complete a game is completed when I've killed 16 points worth of troops off of the enemy so uh, the elite foot are four the chariots are four the Raiders four um, battle taxi uh, skirmisher three rabble two uh, archers are four heavy foot three warband three so I have to kill 16 points so it makes a difference what I kill so I will not win the game by killing all of the sea people's rabble uh, if I'm the Egyptian player I got to start kidding into some of the core of their army before I'm going to have a victory uh, and the same goes for killing the warband and even the three heavy foot that's not going to be enough uh, to finish the battle on for the Egyptians so you have to kill some of the core units you've got to kill a significant quantity of their fighting force that's why it's 16 points um, to, to win the game uh, 
And basically, the game would start with the Egyptians being the advantage player. They would go first. They would roll for their command pips. Six, it's a good start. They would do six things. They would move their forces forward. Then if there was any archery fire, because we do have archers on the table, uh, archers from both sides would fire, and they would take turns firing. The non-moving player fires first in archery, and we'll cover archery in a separate video as well. Um, so you move, you, com you conduct archery or long-ranged fire, uh, then you conduct any combat, if any stands are in combat uh, contact, and then it's the other side's pl play. So then the sea people would roll. The sea people got six pips as well. I'm going to remember to keep that dice for later. Um, so then the sea people would do their move, conduct archery, and conduct combat, and you would continue until somebody lost 16 points. So at this point, you're ready to play uh, and head on towards victory. Uh, keep in mind, too, we talked about points for these. Camps. The reason we have camps on the table, if you lose your camp, that's eight points. That's halfway to victory. So obviously, if the chariots could swing around and get to the Sea People's camp, that'd be a great strategy. Uh, hence the reason that the Sea People are going to want to make sure they stay close to the camp and defend it. Same problem for the uh, Egyptians, except the Sea People don't have anybody who's going to probably do that. So... That's the setup. Um, that's the army deployment. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you'll keep watching. Uh, I think we're going to be doing some more on archery. I promised one on troop types and any questions that come in from the new players or, or experienced players that you want me to cover, just let us know on the forum, on the Facebook site, or uh, on the YouTube channel. Uh, go out to War a Wargame Vault if you want an electronic copy. And don't forget to go to Scale Creep Miniatures if you'd like to get a uh, printed copy of the rules. And thanks again for watching. My name's Rod Kane. Uh, this game is called Triumph. And I really appreciate you uh, paying attention to the videos.